Uh, look, we'll get underway. I know there's some people going to crowd in the back there, but uh, we've run out of uh, seating. Um, can I introduce uh, Emil Zankoff to you? Uh, he's a teacher at uh, Mark Olfen College, and um, they have a, a relationship with uh, a school in the United States, and uh, we've been trying to get Emil to come and talk to us about his experiences uh, with that school, uh, known as High Tech High. And so he's going to give you an opportunity to, or he's going to talk to you about it, but give you an opportunity to ask any questions at the end that you might have on uh, on uh, Over to Emil. Right. Thank you, Bob. Um, so just a quick uh, brief background on myself. I graduated at the end of 2008, and during that time at uni and probably a few years afterwards, I sort of started to look at this school in the States called uh, High Tech High. They're based in uh, San Diego. Um, and from there, started making contact and, and talking, and eventually um, our school uh, uh, bought into their leading schools program, which is a paid program that the school actually uh, paid for us to go and train with them. So this is a quick snapshot over a year-long uh, program. So it's probably a good opportunity now for me to talk to you about it rather than if I'd uh, done it a few months prior because we finish up, my last trip to the States is in, uh, in June, um, in a, about five weeks. Um, so I'm going to go probably for about 20 minutes and then I really want to give you an opportunity to ask questions and hopefully I uh, stimulate some of those questions and give you a bit of an idea it was actually, um, when I put the presentation together, I was racking my head about how do you, how do you talk about such a massive program. So um, I might divert in a few different ways just so I can sort of encapsulate the entirety of it. Okay, so um, High Tech High, they're really big on their acronyms. Um, so High Tech High, and I'll talk about the High Tech High Graduate School of Education, which is for teachers around the world. Um, that they have contact with. Um, it was founded over 12 years ago, around 2000, um, by Larry Rosenstock and Rob Riordan. Um, they were primary school, um, middle school, and actually high school teachers for about uh, 10 plus years in the public American education school system. And they saw a big need for a change. It happened uh, that at the time, uh, they both went and said, look, we've had enough and there was money and grant money for them to go around America and look at schools and look at what was happening and sort of just investigate in terms of the system. Um, if you know much about or anything about the public American school system, it's not really that flash hot. Um, it then uh, came about that there was an old Navy base uh, at Point Loma in San Diego that uh, was basically decommissioned and that was given back to the city of San Diego. At the same time, Larry Rosenstock and Rob Riordan and a few others like Jeff Robin, who I'll show you, um, were coming, sort of finishing up, and there was an opportunity to start up. The area was growing to start up a brand new school, a public charter school. So it's not, um, every student there is enrolled for a lottery system, okay, around the state. So it, they actually put their name down and it is a computer generated system and the only thing that school knows about the student is their first and last name and the zip code and that's it. Okay, so the school is really big on project based learning and I guess when people hear that they often sort of have um, I guess ideas and thoughts because of um, what they've heard about in the past. And I was a little bit like that in terms of um, what I'd heard. Um, it really is uh, an entire system at that school that operates under that project-based learning model. And I'm going to show you a, a short five-minute video that, um, that I took um, that hopefully gives you a better, better understanding of how they do project-based learning. Because often, project-based learning um, what we think of it, um, is actually project-oriented learning. And there's a, and there's a difference and I won't go too much into the detail, but often if we ask students and we think, oh, we're doing a project-based learning, we'll teach the students for five weeks a concept, and then at the end of it, oh, can you please produce me a poster or a model, and done. That's project-orientated learning, whereas High Tech High, through their timetabling system, 
and the way that teachers work in groups of three or in two, sometimes on their own as well, they run a system where students create a product uh, and, and go through that process straight from concept all the way, all the way through. So, um, and their leadership uh, heavily supports it. Larry Rosenstock, who co-founded it, he's the CEO, is still at the school. Um, he still has an office um, straight at the school. Okay, um, so how would you compare High Tech High to Charles Campbell, uh, Mark Oliphant, Australia College, Trinity, Windsor? Um, it has a diverse mix of students. There are actually, um, these are the campuses, okay? Um, it's become almost a brand now, High Tech High. And it's really interesting, the name sort of thing, oh wow, it's going to be technological and everything else. It actually really isn't. Um, when they were going through, Larry and Rob, uh, thinking about the school and what to call it, um, they had uh, marketing people come and, you know, they were uh, throwing out names and go, what, what would bring people to school? Well, you know, and came around. High Tech High was the name that sort of was devised, even though they often sell, sell themselves, they say themselves that we're very low tech. Um, not in a lot of ways, but so it's very comparable. Um, I'd say Charles Campbell. MOC or Australia, all these schools would have exactly the same amount of technology, if not more, than High Tech High. Approximately 5,000 students across all these different schools. Um, okay, 99% of their students attend college or university, and they have something like above 85% graduating and finishing four-year college degrees. I'll show you a few websites in a second. They really track their students afterwards. Um, they, it's all data collected. Um, that they require, so it's not. Um, it's a real system of we want to know where you are and what you've done, um, backed up by a lot of research. So, to give you a sense of the schools and the locations, okay, and the one that I work with um, closely, um, Chula Vista is here, okay. So Chula Vista is right here um, in San Diego, and the border of Mexico, and you'll see in the video, is actually right here, and Tijuana is somewhere around there. I often joke, you know, is there a chance that we can go down to Tijuana while we're there, but not, that didn't really happen. So that's Chula Vista, one of the campuses, okay? Here is the original uh, sort of site for the campuses. That's uh, Point Loma, okay? So you can see sort of the spread, and then up, above their brand new campus. Okay. Where are we? Back a little bit further. Their brand new campus um, that they built here is in North County. Okay, North County is a brand new area in um, San Diego. It's a bit like uh, what's happened in um, uh, where I work, uh, Play for the Live project, but this is uh, sort of very upper class gated community. Um, Chula Vista, right near the Mexico border, that's a lot more comparable to Mark Oliphant College. Point Loma, uh, where the um, Navy base is, you know, that could be comparable to a lot of different schools. Okay, so they really cover the whole of um, that part of San Diego. Okay. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about the Leading Schools program. Um, there's a number of different uh, programs that the graduate school runs. Um, this is one of them, it's the Leading Schools program, it's their sort of main program. Well, what they do is they take teachers from another country, they've worked with teachers from around the world, India, Canada, Australia, um, pretty much uh, I Iran, if just about any other country uh, that you can think of. And you work um, with the school in, in a team and you get a, what they call a critical friend, which is another teacher at High Tech High. And you go about, I guess, a learning journey, a whole entire process, uh, reflecting on what you do as a teacher, uh, what you do at your school, um, what is, what's some of the curriculum that you look at. And you go through a process of really infusing yourself in terms of their model of teaching, but then looking at how do you do that in your own school, in your own context, because they realise that High Tech High was built 
from uh, a sense of, you know, we need to do something different in high schools and they were lucky enough to start that from scratch and they understand that a lot of teachers that come into the Leading Schools program, you've got to work to the administration and the confines of your system. So um, we do video conferencing, um, we obviously visit the school face to face and then we go through a process of where we create projects and products that we actually execute with our students as well. Um, and then you uh, go back and forth with your critical friend in terms of reflecting on what you're doing as a teacher, as an educator and so on. Um, that takes about a year, so I'm coming down to the end of my project and as part of my product I'm creating an iBook. Um, and uh, my product is around, I teach uh, computer gaming, so I teach students how to program computer games using Java. And as part of that, um, my iBook is about how do I infuse literacy in a computer gaming subject. Um, and so the iBook's in creation at the moment. It's not, it'll, it'll be free, so you can download it once it's, <laughs> once it's out. There's a lot more questions that I'm sure you have, but um, I want to show you a few behind the scenes, and I'm, um, I think I'm doing well with time. Uh, lead from behind so they understand that you can't really do a lot of this work uh, completely in a whole sense. You've got to sort of do it, do it in little pockets often. Um, and a whole school change to project-based learning is often unreal. It is an often unrealistic challenge. I'm putting asterisks there. I mean, a really it does come down to administration and staff and and the whole school coming to it. In Larry Rosenstock, when we had a meeting with him, he sat down with us. I said to him, Larry, what would happen if you know um, you sort of pulled the brakes up a little bit on this and um, you know slow down? He goes, I guarantee you that in uh, five weeks we go back to being a traditional high school. So they work really hard in terms of a whole school model to keep project based learning at the forefront of what they do. Um, it's a, sometimes I mean, you might go there and you think this is a bit cultish and especially the way the students they know all the acronyms and they talk about the school and everything but then when you dig a little bit deeper um, what they're really trying to infuse in the kids is just the love of learning as a base level and it sounds a bit cheesy but um, a lot of their students, uh, because they come from such diverse backgrounds, extremely well-off uh, backgrounds to extremely poor, um, th that's the principle of everything that they do. A love of learning, a love of um, generating um, information and looking at r really real-world authentic topics. And through that then, they infuse um, the California uh, state systems requirements, the curriculum, because um, like you saw in the previous stats, they have uh, fantastic results in terms of getting kids to college and university. Probably, probably one of the best in the States, I'd say. You wouldn't see many having a 99% return rate for that many students. Okay, so uh, let's just go through a few things. goes for about five minutes and what I'm going to talk over it a lot and mute, and, and mute the, uh, the volume. Uh, they do a lot of art projects at High Tech High. That previous one that you saw was an old cigarette um, dispenser machine and what they wanted to do was they generate funding a lot from uh, the community and so they created a project where in tech they took the old cigarette um, machine, reconverted it and they put student art pieces inside there. Okay, and that sits out the front of the school and so when family and friends come into the school they can actually buy some of the artwork that students from around the school have created. Okay, so that's a sort of collaboration type model. Um, that's a bit of video showing, uh, they're doing trigonometry I think in there in math. So you can see the standard uh, classes, okay, but what you'll notice with the school, this is um, I think at Point Loma at the, um, at the Navy base. 
uh, you'll notice just R everywhere, and it's all student created. Um, okay, um, uh, they found a partner that was 50 years older than, them, than themselves. They learned to apply an interview technique to gather stories from their partner's lives. Students then wrote three minute plays based on their partners. Um, Okay, and they often do massive performances and they bring in parents and community a fair bit. Um. You see a um, lot, lot of remnants from the Navy base, okay, the exposed piping and all those types of things, but the student art is just. Uh, can't get over how much there is and it's constantly changing you go there in three months time and all that art would have disappeared this was a mass science project okay looking at um, uh, Newton's law and what else did they have there a few other things um, student created um, these are some of the visitors that are uh, coming to the school so Yale University New York University um, Darmoff uh, Pizza College they they um, they constantly have uh, different um, visitors come to the school. Yeah, this is at the Navy base. Okay. This was in a this was a year nine class. So this is in a hallway. It would be like the hallway out there. Okay, and there was you had year nine students. Um, a whole class of them, and they were uh, they were creating Rube Goldberg machines. Okay, if anyone knows anything about Rube Goldberg machines, uh, classic cartoons where you start from you want to do something simple, and you got this whole complex contraption, you know, to blow out a candle. So the students were looking at the math, uh, obviously the science and the, and the physics behind that. So, like, really, um, that wasn't anything high-tech high there, right? The, the, you know, the primitive type materials, but then when the students showed us the books <coughs> and the mathematics behind what they were researching, you sort of start to see where the whole point of all this is going with their, their projects. That's actually with a design tech teacher and a maths teacher, and they're working with that project the whole time. So, um, this was a, that is a fish tank. Um, with a fish and so on, a humanity subject, okay, with science, and they're actually growing fish and so on. What's interesting, the humanity side of it comes from, they wanted to see if they could influence the market of Chula Vista, this is in uh, the school near Mexico, if they could influence the fish market prices depending on how much they flood with their own uh, fish at the school. Okay, so, um, you know, humanities and obviously the science behind um, what they set up. who Qualcomm is. They're a huge company in San Diego. Okay, um, I'll let her explain then I'll... Oh, the owner of Qualcomm, his son is actually from New our school. And so for this uh, project we Jerry. incorporated different math concepts that we were There was two people that founded the original school, Jerry um, and uh, Jenny's wife. Um, that, and his father was the founder of Qualcomm. Okay, so that was where the initial school in 2000 had the backing. Um, and so every and so what we did, we created a box which you could create with any dimensions you wanted. And we also had to make a bungee cord. And we didn't know how long the bungee cord had to be, so we had to calculate that. And the point was we took it to a bridge and we put an egg inside. And you didn't want your egg to break wiggle. So it was up to us to find the calculations for the bungee cord and also like what type of energy we would be using for so it was physics and math. So where was the egg? It was inside the inside box. And you just had to keep the egg safe? Yeah, you had to keep it safe and get it as close to the ground without breaking. Who won? Uh, I actually don't remember. Yay. Mm -hmm. 
this was a bike pass and an art project. Well. Okay, what's interesting about this shot that you'll see, this is from Chula Vista, and, I, and as I stood there, I realized that actually what I'm looking at is the border of Mexico. Okay, I'll zoom in in a second, you'll see it. Um, they actually have students from Tijuana, Mexico, come to the school every morning for classes. Um, so they go through the whole process. Um, and so it's really interesting, you get like the diversity at Chula Vista is amazing and it's very different to North County where it's a lot more preppier type school and then Point Loma which is pretty standard, you get a whole mix of San Diego families. They told us sometimes there are illegal immigrants running around back here. Really? So, yeah. Like a little so right now we're looking at the, the prison? Back. Yeah, the prison's right like there. Yeah. That's not all that area. That's sort of in a way, it's good because you can do the wrong thing, you know. Oh. Relevant, but this is still awesome. Okay, so uh, periodic table of he uh, elements, heroes, and villains. And so, you know, this would have been an art and science type project um, with the art teacher and the science teacher. Hasn't it not written or knowing? Oh, yeah, I love that. Yeah. Um, this was just random throughout the day. Um, I saw this. This is at um, the, the Point Loma base. They were doing an experiment with. Um, um, Gravity and science, and they were looking. I think they this was, may have been part of that egg type experiment. So, uh, just a little bit. There's no uniforms at the school. Uh, for people in the back. In this project, students brainstormed, organized, and created timelines uh, with 10 of their most significant life events on the backs of their composition books. After each student chose one of their most memorable life experience, they helped shape who they are today and wrote a personal narrative based on that experience. The wall timeline is a combination of all their personal narrative stories in chronological order. Okay, that's just a really small shot that actually is quite massive, and this is, uh, this is on a be on the typical wall out there. I can't, I couldn't really remember one piece or one wall or window in their school that didn't have some type of student created project on there. Um, you actually, initially you're overwhelmed and then you're just like, oh, this is normal. Okay, uh, I think I've got a better picture of that. They're actually uh, measuring uh, brim, shrimp, and looking at the coral and those types of things behind it. This is in a hallway, uh, not in a hallway, this is in a typical area of the school. This is at uh, uh, North County, okay? And that was just stationed up. This is a bit more techie. Uh, they, um, they have a whole massive robotics program at, um, at the High Tech High International where um, they compete uh, constantly at the first um, robotics <laughs> league and prior to that they also look at the Lego league which has been running in South Australia for about three years but then they go on and students create their own metallic working programmed robots. Um, so uh, here they're looking at um, rovers, remote operated vehicles. There's some artwork students had to create. Uh, I think their brief was to design comfortable chairs. Okay. Uh, this was really interesting. This was a humanities and physics uh, project where they looked at different uh, time uh, times in history. Okay. Um, now to wrap your head around the size and scale of this project. Um, uh, as I wrap up, you, it, it was about up to the size of the projector. Students created each um, each of these, okay? So they took a period of time. So I think this was like incurs, and then each cog was linked up to another cog. There's a few more photos. They laser cut these, okay? So this was all um, done with a laser machine. Year nine students. Rebellion. People are without community. These people decide to establish more funding at the rest. So this is uh, talking about leadership. They design these on a great program. This cog 
Gears program. I think it was from workinggears.ca. Um, it's, it's a brilliant program. It costs $20 or something like that. And you could simulate um, how the gears worked and so on. The students designed on that, then they went and actually executed um, and built their own. So humanities and, and physics teacher, they spent, I think it was seven, eight, nine weeks straight with both teachers, and probably they spent the majority of their day um, doing this. And that's the size of it. So my friend there, Tom, he is uh, six foot something, okay? And that gives you the size of the scale. So it works off two little motors on the back. The backup motor is actually um, just there for show. And when it runs, everything is turning and spinning. Um, at the time, they actually had, they didn't have it running because it was uh, going to be put up in the boardroom. Um, so probably one of the most prized places to put up um, artwork at the school. Again, off the electronics. Some of their robotics pro. These are the robots that they built at school. Uh, along this wall right here, you'll see our little robot creations. Um, so it's pretty, it's pretty cool. So these are the robots that they actually sent to compete in the tournament. So the robotics program is phenomenal. Um, the and competitions and stuff, and then they do things from like throwing uh, balls and hoops or anything to simulating battle with the robots. But anyway, um, those awards on the wall you see right there. Um, I'm doing well for time. We're just about to hit half an hour. There is a little ping pong collaboration video which helps explain um, what they do, but I'll, I'll link you to that video. I just wanted to show you a few different things about what we do. So the school, as part of the project, we use Edmodo and we communicate. Um, as part of the high, uh, leading schools program, I post ideas and um, we um, write up our summaries and, and topics of what you know what we're doing um, at school and reflecting on work. I should have started passing these around earlier, but Ron Berger um, is uh, a man that the school, I guess, um, has had a huge influence. Um, he has had a huge, a huge influence on the school. He's written this book, An Ethic of Excellence. Um, it's a fantastic read. And this is another book that, these are books that as part of um, our curriculum in the Leading Schools program we've been asked. So um, I'll pass these around, um, have a quick flip through and then pass them back to the person, I probably won't get through to everyone. Um, obviously some statistics, you can't read that at the back. Uh, 5,000 students, like I told you, um, their operating budget is around $30 million. This is a school um, that, I mean, they, they generate so much of their money from uh, donations from the community, from sponsorships. They hunt grants like I've never seen any other school hunt uh, grants. I mean, Mark Oliphant, we do it pretty well, uh, but this school is on just another level. Um, and that's why they can send their students in terms of their experiences. Often they do their uh, place, you know, some of their placements in England. Uh, when I was there, they were sending 12 students with a teacher to England to spend two weeks as part of one of their humanities subjects. But that's all funded through grant money and through student, um, uh, I guess, fundraising abilities. Um, and the professional development opportunities, this is where they get a lot of their money from. So um, they have um, what they call odysseys for new staff um, to develop their skills. They have um, residencies where you come as a teacher and learn about project-based learning, a winter residency, a spring residency, summer institute. Uh, they obviously have the leading schools program and all these costs, but they have teachers constantly um, at the school and the students are so used to it. Um, it's like nothing, it doesn't even matter uh, when they have two or three hundred people at their school at these presentations. So um, that's that. And um, they have, uh, like I talked about, this, this, the stats behind their college entrance. 
is uh, really important to them, okay? They're not a high, I, I guess in America it really is like, okay, you're a high school, but um, who, you know, where is my kid gonna go after high school? And so um, they collect a lot of their data, which is open for you to have a look at. Uh, since 2003, okay, because obviously it started in 2000, but it wasn't year 12 at the time, um, they've graduated uh, 700, 790 students. 100% of these students have been accepted into college or uni, and 99% attended college or university in the fall after their graduations. Okay, so there's some of the universities and colleges that they go to. Okay. Right. And then you can obviously have a look at the statistics. The family connection account can be used. So they're very open in terms of the GPA, SATs, um, uh, SAT scores, and all those types of things. Um, um, that is about it for me. I could guess I could go on, um, look, you know, looking at my digital portfolio, which I had to create as part of the Leading Schools program. So um, this is on the web as well. You can have a look at some of the stuff I'm doing with my computer gaming students now um, in terms of the course and those types of things. But this was, this was one of the products that we had to create. Digital portfolios are becoming huge for teachers. I don't know if you've heard much about it, but um, this will be often a way that um, you know, people know what you do and where you do it, and, and it's really quite open. I've got all my assessments and things like that on there. You can have a look. Um, I've got no doubt in less than five years that every teacher will have a digital portfolio of some sort um, present, so it's part of that. Um, if you want to know a little bit, because I didn't have time to play that video, jeffrobin.com, he's an art teacher at High Tech High and one of the founding teachers. He's probably one of their gurus in terms of what he does uh, with the projects. So I'll leave it at that. That's half an hour. Done well. You have. Um, if there's any quick questions, happy to take them now. That's it? Done? Yeah. Beautiful. Okay, thank you very much. No